Dana Martin is an author and peaceful parenting advocate, spreading the message of freedom and children's rights. Author of the books Radical Unschooling, A Revolution Has Begun, and Sexy Birth. She's been featured on The Dr. Phil Show, Nightline, 60 Minutes, The Jeff Probst Show, and most recently, ABC's hit show, Wife Swap. Her articles, videos, and TV appearances have helped thousands of families on their path to live with more freedom, peace, and joy. We hear words like rebellion and chalk it up to normalcy. But what if there was nothing to rebel against? What if we lived with the same respect for our children that we demand they have for us? What if we could recognize that punishments model injustice and that through using power to control another person, we are teaching them to do the same? It is through loving, kindness, and understanding that children learn love and peace and in turn will reflect this back on the world. Respecting children's rights and freedoms is a revolutionary approach to parenting and education. This is a parenting philosophy on the leading edge of new thought, yet it is rooted in instinctual wisdom. Our culture needs to realize that living with respect and freedom with our children is the most responsible way to create a peaceful world. Hello. Hi, welcome. This is Dana Martin. Welcome to Try This at Home. This is my first uh, radio broadcast with UCY Radio. Um, I was interviewed by a show recently through this network, and I was invited to have my own show on here. So I'm really excited about being here. And I'm here to talk to you today about unschooling and peaceful parenting. And that covers a lot of different topics in our culture right now. I think... Um, it's kind of like a hot topic. Unschooling has been in the media a lot lately. Um, my family has been on television a few times, as I said in the intro. My son, Devin, is – I have four kids. My son, Devin's 14, and he's actually with me today. He's going to co-host with me. And I have uh, three other children. I have a daughter who's 12. Her name is Tiffany. I have a daughter, Ivy, who just turned nine yesterday. And my son, Orion, just turned six. His birthday is today, actually. So four kids, never been to school, never been punished. Yet they are awesome human beings and really interesting people, and um, they learn just through living life. They've never had any kind of forced learning, so we've never done any kind of curriculum. They've never been told what to learn. In fact, this philosophy is pretty mind-blowing for most people because um, I, I don't believe that I know better than my children why they're here on this earth. I, I mean, I'm definitely their their mother, and a leader in their life, but I don't look at me as an authority. I look at me as their partner. So what I'm going to introduce you to is a lot of different kind of concepts and ways that you will, can understand parenting in a way that definitely promotes more peace and freedom and a lot more joy in your life. 99% uh, of parenting books on the market today are focused on obedience and meeting the parents' needs. You know, all the all the television shows like the nanny shows and so forth, they're all focused on meeting the parents' needs for compliance and obedience and uninterrupted sleep and, and everything's so focused on behavior and behavior modification that um, you, you rarely, rarely ever hear the philosophical perspective of what is what are the child's needs? You know, nobody cares. No one ever asks those questions. However, I ask those questions and I have always focused on the needs under my child's behavior. So uh, we don't live in the authoritarian paradigm where I demand obedience. Um, like I said, my children have never been punished. Uh, they have never been forced to do anything they don't want to do, ever, believe it or not, <laughs> which I am really happy to answer the de and share the details as to how that is, um, but it is truth. Our children don't have any bedtimes. They don't have any restrictions on media or foods. Yet, I think you'd be pretty surprised with the choices they make. So this is a whole philosophical idea of, I assume, positive intent for my kids. And that's something that wasn't extended to, extended to most of us growing up. Like, people always assume negative intent from kids. And people even do today. I can remember um, after Devin was born, being told that um, I shouldn't hold him if he cries because he'll start 
manipulating me and taking advantage of that. And I, I, I had a really hard time following that because all of my mothering instincts were telling me to pick him up when he was crying and, and to feed him when he was hungry. So I unintentionally, I guess, became a rebel to traditional parenting advice. I had doctors and friends and family telling me that I was so wrong for having him in the bed with us that he needed to, needed to be in a crib. But everything inside me always told me that um, I trusted him and I loved him and I believed him. So when he cried and, and, and told me his needs, I always surrendered to that and it felt right. So from the beginning... Like, I never planned to be this radical. I never planned to live this life off the beaten path. It's just something that happened really naturally. So to me, this is just an extension of what I've been doing since my first child was born. <clears throat> and it all started when I had a natural birth. Like, I never, like, I'm, I was the biggest wuss you ever met. Like, I never, ever thought that I could have a natural birth. I read all the books, and when it came time for labor, holy, I was not prepared for the level of difficulty that it was but I had a supportive midwife and he was born in a hospital with a midwife and I did it like I, I could not believe could not believe that I accomplished something like that he was over nine pounds and I didn't have drugs and it was just this huge um, boost in my self-confidence well I went on being so empowered by that it was life-changing for me that I went on to become a childbirth educator and support other women that if I could do it my God, you could do it. And um, my second child was born at home. And trust me, I'm not like like a hippie mama, like um, you'd picture somebody having a home birth. Like before I had uh, kids, if somebody would have mentioned home birth to me, I would have thought it was like a mountain woman, you know, someone up living in the mountains that doesn't shave and, you know, pushing out her babies, having a home birth, this hippie mom. But that's so not me. I, I, I've always been, um, I don't know, I guess I never fit in a box, <laughs> really. But um, I had an awesome birth with my daughter, and it was really empowering, and it brought me to that other level of trust. And then I had a home birth with my third child, and it was really hard. It was challenging. She was uh, over 11 pounds and posterior, which if anybody knows what that is, it is a painful labor. And I almost went to the hospital. It was so challenging. However, um, she was born wonderfully at home. And <clears throat> then with my fourth child, this will really blow your mind, he was... 11 pounds, and it was a painless birth. Like, I had gotten that good at knowing what not to do, I guess, that he, it was a painless birth, and it was actually really joyful. I wouldn't say it was an orgasmic birth like people talk about. I haven't reached that level yet, and uh, considering we're not having any more kids, I probably will never know what that is, but it was painless, and it was awesome. So um, I wrote a book called Sexy Birth, and that kind of talks about my birthing experiences, but I know most of you listening probably aren't interested in that tonight. What you're probably interested in hearing is what the show is going to be about well, <clears throat> there's a lot of different levels of things that I want to talk about. Unschooling, I uh, wrote a book called Radical Unschooling. And Radical Unschooling is a twofold philosophy. On the one hand, it's educational freedom. It is living life as though school doesn't exist. It's knowing that learning, children learn best when they're internally motivated to learn. And I am not my child's teacher. However, I'm my child's learning facilitator. And I bring as many resources into their lives as possible to learn and grow from based on their interest. It's a really joyful life. I'll tell you one thing, though. It is not for the lazy parent. It is very hands-on. Um, I'm always facilitating their learning in different ways. Um, the other part of unschooling I'm going to talk about, radical unschooling, is the parenting aspect. And that's the partnership parenting I'm talking about. So it's a twofold philosophy of trust. So unschooling is trust in educational freedom. And radical unschooling is extending that trust into every area of your child's life. So, again, my son Devin is here. Hi, Dev. Hi. <laughs> Devin's never been to school. <clears throat> He's never been punished. He's. Uh, we've appeared on a few different television shows together. For some reason, people really love to interview the two of us together. So, most recently, we were on the show Wife Swap, which was a crazy experience. They contacted us really late one night, and the process began. Um, we went on the show because everybody in our family agreed to what we explained to all the kids, what it would entail. We would not have gone on unless everybody wanted to do it. So we dove in. We were swapped. I was swapped with a mom from uh, San Diego. She was extremely strict, totally militant. Her husband was a Marine. It was a really good experience for me going out there. I loved the family. I loved those kids, and they really loved me being there. However, for my family... What would you say, Devin, your experience was? <clears throat> well, um, you know, at first, um, 
we walked into the living room and Cindy was there and my first impression was, Oh, she looks nice. You know, she, I don't think this will be very hard or I didn't think she'd be very strict, but, um, and for the first, you know, week it didn't seem like that. But then when it was her turn to, um, when it was her turn for the rules, then she completely changed. I mean, it was clear that she was totally being fake with us for the first week and her real self came out then and she was the complete, What's the word? <laughs> What's the word that you can use on radio? Uh, yeah, can we swear? Dictator, can we s- dictator? Yeah, I think that's a good word. Um, but she was yelling and spitting at us, and it was not a pleasant experience. I think that's really interesting because I think a lot of people that maybe saw her, I know she was a little extreme, but I think that's what a lot of kids in our culture are used to. They're used to kind of the dictator or authoritarian paradigm where – uh, the parent is the one that kind of sets rules and enforces them. Um, I like to say that rules are a replacement for being there. That is one of the quotes that I get the most of a hard time saying because it really triggers people. Rules are a replacement for being there. Rules are, have to be enforced with punishment. And when you're living in a partnership paradigm, there's really no need for rules at all. I mean, I, I don't have any rules with my husband. I don't punish my husband. That same respect and love is extended to my children. Um, I don't even know. It must have been really awkward to be in a situation um, for you, Devin, where she was like setting rules. And I think it probably came off really that you guys were kind of bratty is what something I re- because you guys just weren't even in tune with listening or obeying them. However, the interesting thing is if you were to be in our home, you would see that when I do ask my kids something, they respect it, but it's not because they're afraid. They respect and I guess listen uh, or obey. I, I don't know how to really word it any other way because I respect them and um, it's not forced. So our kids help us out when we ask them to because we help them out. And, you know, children learn what they live. So it's partnership parenting is really taking it to that next level. Don't you think? Yeah, I agree. Well, one thing I do want to talk about too is the aspect of when you have a child in school, I think a lot of people you know, we've been really brainwashed and conditioned to think that we're living in freedom, that the U.S. is such a free place. And we live in New Hampshire. So even in New Hampshire, you know, we have live free or die. And we're really conditioned in the state to think that we're very free. However, when you have to ask permission to be with your children and you actually have to get permission to take them out of an institution and the needs of the institution come before your family, I hope people realize that that is not true freedom. That is anything but, and you've been really brainwashed to think that that is freedom. Um, Our children, we'd never have to ask permission from any institution to be with our kids. We're never reprimanded. Our kids are never punished. We are truly, truly free in every sense of the word. So our kids have educational freedom, and they also have something that not a lot of people ever really think about, but our kids have freedom of mind. No, children in our in our culture, do not have that basic human right and basic freedom of having the freedom of mind. Their minds are constantly prodded, and people want to find out what's in the child's mind, and they try to assess and grade and measure. However, you'll never really know what's in somebody else's mind by testing. So um, the whole testing thing is another whole whole conversation altogether. But, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that raising free-thinking entrepreneurs is a goal. For us, so my ultimate goal when people ask me, what do you want for your children, is I want my children to be happy. And it doesn't matter what they do with their lives, how they choose to spend their time, and what they end up becoming. Well, to be honest, they're already what they're going to become right now. Uh, I think unschooling is a real present-based philosophy. Um, people with kids in school and just our culture in general are, are always focused on the future. It's like this future-based living, and children are always asked, what are you going to be when you grow up? And no one ever really focuses on the fact that children can be something now because uh, children are not just apprentices to adults, and every single preparation in their life when a child's in school is preparation for adulthood. And Kids, I mean, I know it's kind of a played out saying, but kids really don't have time to be kids when you have a child in school. So um, Devin is things, he, he has been an entrepreneur since he was four years old. His first business was Devin's Confections, and we bought him a chocolate melter and all the chalk he's laughing because it was 
<laughs> it was so cute, you know, like I, I really wanted to help him. And so I facilitated this business and it, it never got too, too big. I mean, he was only four or five years old, but he, he would give chocolates to family and friends and he had a little website. And, um, now my son is a blacksmith. He does a leather worker. Um, he's a bladesmith. He is something now when he's only 14 years old. He has his own Etsy store. But I want to share like how he became a blacksmith. Um, he showed an interest in blacksmithing. And as his learning facilitator, I know that whatever my children's interest and passions are, are the nucleus of their learning. So it's my job to bring as many resources as possible into their lives for them to learn and grow from. And although we don't break our life down into subjects, like we do not live life at all like schools do. And we don't say this is math, this is English, this is science. However, if we were to, just for the sake of kind of sharing how unschooling works, you would see that through facilitating whatever interest he's, our kids are into, it does touch on every subject, just as a side effect of them really delving into it. So when Devin showed an interest in blacksmithing, um, I know what kind of learner he is. He's a real visual learner at this point in his life. So, I mean, we watched YouTube videos. I did order him some books. But not only that, but I contacted a local blacksmith, and he came over, and he served as Devin's mentor and brought him an anvil and showed him. You know, he's like a 70-something-year-old man, like really wise. He's had a shop for 30 years, and he was somebody that was so excited to show Devin this amazing art. He was blown away that somebody called him and said, would you mind mentoring my child in blacksmithing? I think it was probably the only time anyone's ever done that. So I like to tell parents that are facilitating their kids learning to don't, don't overlook this as, a, as mentorships as a learning opportunity. This is great. I mean, and people that have this amazing, these amazing skills, they want people to learn from them. So it's, um, yeah, just call somebody if your kid has an interest in something and invite them over, invite them over for dinner and have them share their, their knowledge. But, um, what did you feel? How did you think, you know, what did, what would you think of the experience, Devin, having Ron here? Well, um, I, once I became interested in blacksmithing, I, um, you know, I was doing it with really basic stuff that, you know, was really, really beginner esque. And, um, I kind of forgot that he lived in our town. And when you, um, told me that I should go down and talk to him, I was, I got pretty excited, and then uh, he came over and told me, you know, what I should do, and I've been researching it for a while, and it was using all these terms that I understood, and um, that was very exciting, and he was just so <coughs> helpful, and I mean, I think mentorship is the best way to learn, or one of the best ways to learn. And it's something I don't think many kids in school, or even like traditional homeschoolers, because a lot of people hear that we homeschool we don't tell everybody that we unschool like i think you kind of know who to talk to about that like the yeah. average the cashier at the grocery yeah, store yeah, just, eh, we're homeschool. yeah we just say homeschool <laughs> because unschooling is really just a method of homeschooling it's it's legal in all 50 states there's different regulations in different states um but for for the last i don't know eight years i guess since Devin was six we've been we hire an unschooling friendly evaluator and she comes to our home or you know contacts me online and she is awesome because she breaks everyday things that we do down into what we call schoolies and that's a term that we use to break the average day down into schoolie language so she breaks our life down into subjects and it's all true learning it's all valid our kids know um, as much content as any child in school however it's perfectly catered to who they are as an individual it's amazing how people can think that the way that schools and, and homeschoolers with a curriculum, the way that, that most people are educated is so inaccurate for what the average person should be. Everyone's meant to do something different in life, to really think that we're all meant to do the same thing in life. Therefore, the uh, one curriculum is correct for every single child is so false. In fact, I really believe that unschooling is the perfectly individualized education because it really um, focuses on whatever the child's interested in and what their strengths are and and Devin's really able to pursue this. I mean, to really, what is that you said before we came on this like skill set? What did you say that people were? Well, I forget I exactly. I, I don't want to put I, words in your mouth. I said that I felt like since kids from, you know, until they get out of high school and then they go into college or whatever, even until they get out of there, that seems to be when they can actually start doing things that they want and what they like to do. But I've been doing that 
for my whole life, and I feel like I have a, like a jump start on my skill sets. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm blown away all the time, and I, I think most parents probably are with their kids. We're just blown away with them as people, but as an unschooling parent, to see, you know, philosophically going into this. I mean, I followed my heart. It was instinctual. However, I was going on philosophy and trust when I, I embarked on not sending my kids to school and not buying a curriculum because I read that children will learn um, when they're supported and surrounded with an interesting, rich, full life. And so, you know, our, our home, I don't look at my home as like a museum. I think our culture looks at our home as like a museum and of our things. And and that's not, our, our house is more like, it's more like a workshop of our passions and interests. It's a library. It's a, it, it's not a place where we just house the things we own. We use our home um, and we use every bit of our home for like learning resources. And we have a big library and, and my kitchen's filled with exciting you know, we have baking soda and vinegar and everything for experiments and we have pets and we have we just have a lot to do in our home. So we have a rich, full, exciting life and learning is an important part of just being human. And so I think that's such an important aspect that I like to share with my kids is that learning never ends. And I'm always trying to learn and grow myself. Um, I think it's pretty interesting how when a lot of us turn 18, we just kind of we say to ourselves, oh, God, like you don't even want to do anything that remotely looks like learning because you were so forced to do it for so long that we have this negative association with it. And so that's why kids in college kind of just party the whole time because they're finally free. But I mean, I had to really learn how to learn again. And that's something that I love about my kids and I love about other unschoolers that Devin knows how to learn. I mean, gosh, my, my son Orion, he's six. He knows how to learn. The, the other day, my daughter Ivy was sitting down and she was interested in doing some crafts. Now, mind you, I'm, I'm there by her side if she needs help, but they, they definitely, the older they get, the more they just kind of, they, they pick right up with their learning. I mean, she was sitting down. She Google searched, um, craft activity with popsicle sticks. And I walked out in the, in our, craft area and she had pulled up this whole craft activity that she had found the instructions for and was halfway through the craft. I mean, these kids know how to learn. Now that's something that most adults don't even have a clue about. I mean, I have so many different like groups and stuff where people ask questions. I have a, uh, unschooling groups and people will just ask questions about random things that they could easily do a Google search for. People are so used to being spoon fed information that they don't even know how to, how to learn or how to look things up themselves. They just turn to experts all the time. I feel like saying, uh, you're your own expert. Don't turn to me. You, you can find the answers just as well as I can. So, um, I love that unschoolers know how to learn. That's a very, um, I feel like, um, that's another thing. Like when, you know, when there's people that are out of college or whatever, they, they don't know how to learn. They don't know how to learn any other skill sets. And that's why I think so many people have jobs working at restaurants or doing whatever. And there's not that much skill or talent in what they do. Just sort of like run of the mill, normal jobs, you know? Well, people are really, I mean, I think schools are really good at putting out yes men. They're really good at conditioning people to take orders. So, yeah, yeah. and, and children are really never asked what makes them happy or what they enjoy doing. They're just completely conditioned to take orders and do what they're told. So they slip into a job really easily, no matter where it is. They just step into it and happiness never becomes part of the equation. And, and the way that I'm raising my children and that I've learned to live life is to put happiness first. So I would say that, like, education isn't the goal of unschooling. Now, that sounds really crazy probably when you hear it, but hear me out. Um, the goal of unschooling is to live a rich, full, happy, exciting life together, putting family first, which is something not a lot of people are able to do. They're not allowed to do, nor do they know how to do. However, an education just happens. It's a side effect of living a rich, full, exciting, connected life together. Education, you, you can't keep kids from learning when they're happy and their and their 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 lives are facilitated with focused on what they want to be doing with their time. I mean, my, my kids, I couldn't stop Devin from learning to read if he wanted to. People say all the time, how does your son learn to read? Devin's never done a workbook page in his life for math or English or anything yet. Oh my gosh, he learned how to read. And how, how do you want to share your journey in learning how to read? I think people are always so fascinated yeah, with it. Um, well, when I was uh, probably seven or eight, 
I, um, one of my friends and I started to play, uh, this online video game, and I didn't, I barely, barely know how to read, like, very basic stuff then, and, um, I'd see photos, or the icons of the different items that you gained in the video games, like a sword, and whenever you'd hover over them, it would say the name above the icon, so I learned, oh, that spells sword, and eventually I learned that the S makes a sound because it's in the beginning of sword, and then I could use that, and I connected all that with other words, and now I can read. <laughs> so basically, children learn to read when they're internally motivated. Like so much in school, oh my gosh, so many years of just busy work to keep kids out of society, to keep kids busy, um, is done. That's so unnecessary. I mean, when children are internally motivated, you, you know, reading, writing, and math are all tools to help us get more of what we want in life. So what human being wouldn't want to learn these things? What human being wouldn't want to learn tools to help them get more of what they want? I mean, Devin had an internal motivation, an internal purpose to learn how to read, and he did it easily. When his brain was ready, he picked it up little by little. It was a really organic process. And he reads wonderfully now and writes wonderfully. So there was never any force. He never did anything um, that he didn't want to do as far as reading and writing went. Um, he uses it when he has a real purpose in it. So the same is true with math. You were saying that the <laughs> you speak it much better than me sometimes, Devin, because you're the one actually living this life. Even though I'm facilitating it, you've lived it. You said math isn't separate from life, that it's part of the world. The language of the universe is math, and I actually don't really, I mean, I like to say that I know pretty good math. I mean, I feel like I know better math than most of my friends do, um, and I've never actually, it's a little different than the reading thing, because I don't really remember when I started, quote unquote, I mean, to learn math, and everyone's always learning math. It's everywhere, and... I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> well, I mean, one thing that you were sharing is that, like, I, you said that you use it in blacksmithing. And yeah. you just, you know, you pick up, when you, when you have a use for it, you just learn it as you go. You learn it as you have the use for it. So, I mean, I know for me, math in school was the hardest subject. I hated it. I felt, I felt people have such math phobias now because of the damage that's been done in school surrounding who they think they are when it comes to math and numbers. So, I just love that my kids have never had those kind of issues. They've learned it just through having real life uses for it. And yeah, it's pretty incredible. So if anybody has any questions that are coming to mind for the second half of the show, if you want to uh, log into UCY TV, there's a chat room. You can ask a question through there. Devin is screening the chat room and we are happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'm sure a lot of questions have come up and um, don't worry, there's no question that's too silly because we've heard them all and we're really happy to just be a resource here for you. Um, one other aspect of this life that's really interesting is that the idea of quitting something doesn't even exist in our lives. So what I mean by that is my children will complete as much as they want of a topic until they're personally satisfied. So there's no such thing as quitting. In fact, the whole idea of quitting is based on you doing what somebody else thinks you should so there really is no such thing as quitting. You just use as much as you want of something as a resource until you're done with it. So other people tell you that you're a quitter because you're not up to their standard, but you're up to your own standard. So um, when my kids have gained enough knowledge or information, they move on. And uh, my children's work doesn't have to be finished or completed according to somebody else's standards. They can go as far as they choose to understand a topic um, it's really interesting because this aspect of natural learning is different than a forced learning situation where children are not only forced to finish something based on somebody else's idea, but they're graded but to somebody else's standard on how well they perform. So the focus when it comes to learning isn't on content, but on compliance and obedience above all else. So we're really shifting away from that idea. Let's talk a minute about the freedoms that unschooled kids have that are the most controversial, my most common questions I get from people through email. I've been doing parenting coaching for about six years now, so I'm always happy to have some personal one-on-one -on -one time with people if they're dealing with something unique to their family. But some of the most common questions are about media freedom. People have asked me, well, people tend to really think in extremes, which is really interesting. And people say, 
well, what if your children wanted to watch something really sexually explicit or something ultra violent? And I like to share that when children have complete freedom, they generally don't want to watch anything they're not ready to watch. It's when there's limits put on things that you really push people past their comfort zone. I can remember um, myself being a child and, and forbidden to watch a horror movie. Uh, that the my inner drive for freedom and autonomy was so, so strong that I tended to not even focus on the show I wanted to watch. I just wanted to feel free. And so I, I snuck it. I, I watched things behind my parents' backs that I wasn't ready for. But it, it wasn't even necessarily that I truly wanted to watch it. It's because I was told, no, you're not ready for that. It's bad for you. And damn it, I, I wanted freedom. I wanted to feel I wanted to feel my that I had autonomy in what I was doing. So that is when I think people really get pushed to watch something that they're not ready for, something that, that is uncomfortable for them that might be like traumatizing. I can remember still. I don't even know how old I was, but I ended up watching this horror movie where somebody got electrocuted. And I swear to this day, like I still have a fear of electrocution. Just a little, I do from, because I wasn't ready for it, but I was told nobody trusted me. What would have been so much better is for a parent to say, you know, this is what it's about. If you want to watch it with me, we can talk about it. I'll be there for you to watch it and to be by your child's side to assess for support and information. I mean, I remember Devin must have been, I don't know, it was maybe eight or nine. Do you remember this? You wanted to watch CSI and daddy was really into watching it like every night. He was really into the show CSI and, and Devin really wanted to watch it. And I, and I was, I was like, okay, well, you know, Joe talks about it and he really, likes it. He's excited about the show. So I, I was a little nervous about Devin, my beautiful, pure little son. <laughs> yeah, right. Watching CSI because, I don't know, dead bodies. And like he wasn't really exposed to that so much. He always had freedom with what he watched. But that was kind of a little bit further down the path that he had experienced. And so I just kind of voiced my concerns. And, and Joe said, my husband, like, don't worry about it. I'll watch it with him. And if he's not comfortable, we'll just turn it off. It's no big deal. And so I was a little nervous, but I totally trusted Joe and trusted Devin. It was after I went to bed. And what was so fascinating is the next morning, you know, I said, Devin, what did you think? And what did you think of the dead bodies? And he said, Mom, they were just actors. It's <laughs> They weren't really dead. And he was became so interested in, um, like, forensics that he we, – we had a kit. We got him a kit. Where do you remember that you like put the face on the model oh, yeah, on the that. model and he like learned so much about forensics and science and investigating like there there was so much learning that branched off of this one interest in CSI here I was focused on um, what I thought would be quote unquote damaging to him which he totally knew was fake it wasn't damaging Joe was by his side he you know he Joe would kind of warn him hey this might be kind of gross coming up and, and Devin would sometimes close his eyes or turn his head if he really wasn't comfortable but because he had freedom he was truly able to tune in to what felt right for him and I can't even imagine like if I would have limited out of fear limited him watching that show it would have been limiting his learning because he learned so much as a side effect of watching CSI. Like he got into forensics. He, he learned how to put together I don't know, the whole kit was amazing. Like you put together a, a, a reconstructed a face and yeah. um, it led to so many other interests in his life that I truly believe that any kind of limits limit learning because we don't know what our kids are going to pick up from things that, that we might deem as damaging I know when I was a teen, I was a uh, really into heavy metal. I still am. I still love it. My kids hate it for the most part. Although Devin, like you, it. you're you're way more into it. The girls hate it. They're into like One Direction and all the kind of teeny bopper stuff. Devin like System of System of a Down and some yeah. good music. But I was I really loved bands like Slayer and Metallica and um, I can remember adults in my life like thinking it was so bad. You know the lyrics were so violent and. Um, especially Slayer, for example, they dabbled into like they were accused of being satanic and all these things. And um, what I really loved about Slayer and Metallica and bands like that were that I don't know, like there's always there's a side inside of all of us. I think that the side that has aggression, there's sides that have certain needs of curiosity met through different different forms. Like, you know, when you see a car accident, you can't really look away and horror movies as a team were so fascinating for me um, that music, it really met a need within me that I felt validated. I can remember Metallica, especially 
what they would sing about validated me as a person. And I really, really had a need met. So it did, it did not damage me. In fact, I think if I didn't necessarily have that outlet, I don't know what outlet I would have taken instead um, of having that. So it really, really met a need within me. And um, it's did it. I think I like to say that Metallica, um, I think, led me partially on this path to advocacy for children's rights. I think they were huge advocates for children back in the day when I was reading. They, they understood me. So never think that something your child's listening to or watching or something that they're drawn to is damaging them. You, you have to trust the process and think, I think really putting yourself in your child's shoes, like putting yourself in your own shoes. Remember what it was like to be a child and teen and really look through those filters instead of this conditioned, fearful parent that you've been conditioned to be by our culture. I think that's one of the greatest gifts that I have as an advocate is my ability to put myself back into myself as a child and remember the injustice that I faced. So media freedom, my children can watch whatever they want when they want to with total support from us. They've never wanted to watch anything that I think anybody else would think was like inappropriate. My children don't have any desire to watch porn. People ask that all the time. What about if your kids want to watch porn? My kids don't want to watch porn. I'm sure they will someday. Maybe, maybe not. I have no idea, but it's not because they have freedom. They're not ready for that. And they're not watching those kind of things. Um, the other aspect of freedom is um, food freedom. That's a huge one for people, especially people with little kids, like babies, toddlers, the whole food freedom thing. Now people would probably hear me out. <laughs> We've taken our kids in the grocery store and they each get their own cart if we happen to have a lot of money that week, we have our own business. Sometimes things are really good. Sometimes things are kind of slow. Um, our kids know our financial situation from one shopping trip to the next. We communicate that with them that, hey, yeah, you can each take your own cart this week. Get whatever you want. Bring it back. You wouldn't believe what they choose. I mean, I think you guys did that for Wife Swap, right? But they never aired it. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. Or maybe it was like Oprah. We've done a few different um TV shows where they've there been people have been so interested in that like the whole food freedom idea you know Devin is um all my kids have different dietary choices my daughter Tiffany's vegan she loves animals and a lot of her friends are vegan so she's not into eating animals however my son Devin is well you were paleo for a while yeah. I mean I hate to have a label for um, it necessarily well, but I'd like to get back into that but I <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge glitch in the family right now is Devin really wants to do some homesteading. He really is into that. He wants to be completely self-sustaining and I, and I'm totally on board with him. However, my daughters are very much against killing animals for food. So right now we're yeah, in that. They, they're like, don't take the dead deers here. <laughs> so, so we're in a family discussion right now of how to meet everybody's needs because everybody's needs are valid. And I totally respect that. I want Devin to be able to meet his need to homestead and support our family with food that he hunts. However, my daughter's um, choosing not to eat animals. It's it's a challenging situation. However, I'll, I'll have to keep you guys up to date on how that all goes for our family. But um, yeah, everybody has different dietary needs. Devin researched. He's, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of parkour or free running. Have you, I don't know if anyone in the audience listening has heard of those things. If not, search them. They're, it's a really interesting sport. And Devin researched it and found out that the paleo diet, for example, is really great for people that are very athletic. So he really prefers everything, um, you know, free range, no no pesticides, no horm hormones used. And we buy it organic as much as possible, like we garden and stuff like that. My husband, Joe, I like to call him, he's an opportunist. He eats, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have any label. He eats whatever is available, whatever I put in front of him, he's grateful for. The poor man, he keeps up with all of our uh, our different dietary needs. But I, I have – my point in sharing this is I have no problem making different food for different people according to their needs. But how many of you have heard that, that your parents say or somebody say, I'm not a short-order cook? Well, I mean, I think that's so authoritarian. I'm here to help facilitate not only my kids' learning but their dietary needs. And I, I make like a buffet. I make sure that there's something – a couple things within what I put out that everybody likes, but I'm really happy to make Devin meat and to make my daughter Tiffany and Ivy, whatever they want, the non-meat items. And my, my son Orion and Joe are just happy to eat whatever's there. <laughs> they're, they're not difficult. So, um, yeah, I will make anybody whatever they want, whenever they want. 
which might sound a little crazy, but it's what I've always done. And I'm really just happy to do it. The kids, as they've gotten older, have really kind of, they've learned how to cook for themselves. Even my daughter, Ivy, knows how to cook. So if they're hungry, they'll oftentimes make their own food. But that leads me into our next freedom um, that really triggers people. Um, I was recently, actually, I'm on a show that airs tomorrow morning at 10. It's called The Bethany Show. Bethany Frankel is was one of the real housewives of New York, and she has the skinny girl line of vodka and other products. And she has a talk show out in New York, which I didn't even know about until I was contacted to be on the show. So last week I was flown out to New York as a guest, and I shared about this philosophy on the show. Well, the show isn't Jerry Springer, and it's not Oprah. It's somewhere in the middle, <laughs> I have to say. And I kind of knew you know, I researched it a little bit, but I knew that people wouldn't, I wouldn't have enough time and nor people would people be open to hearing the whole philosophical perspective of partnership parenting. So a lot of shows love to focus on the no rules and not punished. And that's where the kind of focus was. But one of the things that people got really caught up in was that my six year old son, Orion doesn't go to bed until two in the morning. Well, it really is even later than that sometimes, but because our kids have never had any kind of um, you know, they don't have to go to wake up at a certain time because they don't go to school. A natural rhythm for sleep for kids and teens is really different than what most people think. You know, especially in the winter, it changes from season to season. So my kids are up really late this time of year and they sleep late. They get the same amount of sleep as any child in school, if not more. And they're able to completely tune in to when they're tired and when they're rested and they wake up when they're done sleeping for the, for the day or night or whatever. And they, they sleep eight to 10 hours like anybody else. And they're very, very healthy. I, I don't even know. Actually, I don't even know when the last time anyone in my family was sick. It's been years, like literally a year, probably five, six years since anyone's even had a cold. We're, trust me, we're not, we're out living life. We're out in the real world. We're not <laughs> in some bubble or vacuum yet. I really feel like because my kids are able to tune in to their, dietary needs and eat when they're hungry and sleep when they're tired that that's like the basis for health for human health people don't realize how screwed up they are with their whole immune systems by going by somebody else's idea and by living by a clock you guys don't realize how much that's screwing you up man i i swear tune in to your sleeping and eating cycles and bam your immune system is strong no matter what dietary path you follow <clears throat> let's see so anyway, my point was that, holy moly, wait till you see, if you decide to watch the show tomorrow at 10 a.m., uh, well, actually, it's 10 a.m. in the East Coast. I think it's all different times throughout the country. It would be nine. Oh, it's, well, I know it's I 10 know here. It's 10 here, and then, like, I know that it would be 9 in Texas, and Washington, it would be at, like... I don't think seven. so. Like, I think it's, like, 2 or 3. You'll just have to check your own, because that's all, it's, I forget the word. What do they use when the word, when shows are... I can't remember what it is, but anyway, it's, it's, it's on tomorrow at some point. Just look it up. Look up Bethany crazy lady on, you know, crazy lady on schooler. <laughs> Just kidding. But they did like the people in the audience couldn't believe that um, your six year old doesn't go to bed till two in the morning. And to me, like I'm surrounded by people that support our life. Like when you're walking a certain path, I'm sure anyone listening, you know, you surround yourself just naturally with people that, support what you're doing. You know, you, like attracts like. So most of my friends, kids are all on these same schedules. They're, you know, they're all most, most of them are all unschooled and they're all up till three, four, five in the morning chatting through Skype. So to me, it doesn't feel strange at all to, to be living this life. However, I just forget that most of the world doesn't live life like this. So when I was on the show, it was just, it kind of shocked me back into reality. Oh my God, I can't believe that people are so in an uproar about my kids' bedtimes. It was crazy. So um, people really just couldn't wrap their heads around it on the show at all. They, um, at one point, because there's no rules, I was trying to explain the fact that, you know, we live by principles in our family instead of rules. And I tried to explain that rules externally force somebody through fear or manipulation to um, live by somebody else's idea of what they should be doing. And, um, Principles are really different. Principles. I'm sorry, Devin. We had a question coming in, so get distracted. Just show me in a second, sweetie. Um, let me just finish my thought, and then you could tell me what you were going to say. I'm sorry. Principles 
internally motivate somebody based on like a core value or belief. So rules externally force somebody and principles internally motivate. And uh, people just really couldn't wrap their, their heads around the concept. And somebody said, well, you telling me you'd let your two year old cross the street, you know, by themselves. I said, well, no, of course not. I'd hold their hand. And then the very next comment was, you can't hold their hands forever. Cut the cord. And, and it was just crazy because people couldn't figure out if I was extremely permissive or if I was smothering. Like it's such an either or mentality in our culture right now that, that the idea of no, it's neither of those things. This is partnership is completely supporting my children. It's being by their side for whatever they need, but it's, this is not permissive parenting. This is not hands off parenting. This is not unparenting. In fact, that's neglect. That's just, and I've seen people think that that is unschooling. I've seen people on the path to this life that knew what they didn't want to do. They knew they didn't want to punish their children and they knew that they didn't want to be authoritarian, but didn't know what to do in place of it. So they just didn't do anything. And that is really neglectful and it's damaging. However, sometimes people do kind of do that on the path before learning, um, you know, other ways to be. So the, the, the show, the audience had a really hard time wrapping their heads around what this was. So there was a lot of screaming at me and <laughs> I just sat there taking it all in as I usually do with these kind of shows. I'm totally willing to put myself out there and, and be seen, be judged and have people think whatever they're going to for the movement, for um, introducing people to children's rights. And I truly feel that children are the most discriminated people in our culture today. And I really feel like children are people too. <laughs> Another totally corrupt saying. However, really think about it. Children are human beings who have the same feelings we do and the same needs. And they're just not respected in our culture at all. So what were you saying, Devin? Getting back to nature? Yeah, I just wanted to um, mention how a lot of kids, you know, they go to school from... I don't even know, six to three, maybe. <laughs> and, um. I think it's more like seven to whatever. Whatever. I don't know. I don't go to that place. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they're in the cement building all day and they're not connected to nature like we are. I mean, I spend pretty, I'd say almost all the time I'm awake when it's sunny out, outside, in, in the woods, you know? And I feel like that's really being lost by people today because they have been kind of trained not to you know you know kids have recess for 15 minutes but it's so controlled and it's on a playground that it's not even nature you know <laughs> i mean it's on the ground but it's, i don't know i mean i i know i think a lot of people kind of overlook that sometimes how important nature is i mean even in our lives i know it's so important for me to get outside and just connect with the earth connect with nature see now i'm sounding like a hippie it's okay. <laughs> I have this like hippie resistance within me, but I know that part of me is really nature focused. Um, and you know, I, I love, but I love, I just feel like that connection that we all have, that we're all one, you know, like I just feel like we're all connected and, um, you know, that when we do something, I, I believe in karma, man. I believe if somebody like hurts somebody else, it's going to come back to you. So I truly feel like um, the, the damage that's done to children, you know, through the authoritarian paradigm and punishing children and controlling them, man, it, it really, really is damaging to the human being. And kids see it as meanness. No matter what you tell your child to go in the corner and think about when you're punishing them, they're not thinking about what they did. They're thinking about how unjust it is and how mean you are. And resentment is building and it's warping them as people. And the thing about all that is like, if just one gener, like, you know, kids are being abused when they are kids and then they grow up and they're like, Oh, it's my turn to be mean to my kids. If one generation can be nice and real with their kids, then I think that would carry on. I love that. And it's so true. I mean, I, I, I say that to people that I'm working with, with coaching that I, I, this generation, it's hard, you know, like a lot of us walking this path that are shifting from the authoritarian paradigm to the partnership one, we're, you're pioneers, you know, and, and when you're tired or hungry 
you tend to revert back to the way you were raised. You know, it's, it's hard to consciously think of a better way to do things, a more just way, a kinder and more peaceful way to do things. But it, it's so, so important where, where my kids, this is just the way they were raised. You know, it's going to be second nature to them. It's, it's awesome. It's like re, it's rewriting history. It wasn't very long ago, a little over a hundred years ago that men were told to beat their wives when dinner wasn't on the table on time. They were told by their fathers, by their friends, by everybody around them that their their wives' job was to obey their husband. And wives were beaten. I mean, they were there. That was their only role was to obey their men. Look at how far we've come. Look at how far we've come from there. Men are arrested for that now. What we are doing with parenting is the exact same thing now with children. Children are on the forefront of the human rights evolution. And we are pioneers leading the way to share with you that punishment, I don't care if it's timeouts, I don't care what it is, it's unjust and it's cruel, and it's only modeling that power rules. And when you rule over another human being like that, they go through life making other people obey them and and forcing themselves on other people with power. It's extremely narcissistic way to raise somebody. And people are saying in our culture, like, why do we have so many narcissists? Why do you think we have a country full of narcissists because of the authoritarian paradigm? This is where everything starts. How you parent your children is the basis for our entire future. So this is, this is hardcore. This is serious stuff, people. I mean, this is not something to overlook and be like, Oh, this is just for a few radical people. No, man, this is, this is the way of the future. My grandchildren and great grandchildren are going to look back on this time in history in the same way we look back on women's rights. And it's no different. And so I go on as many shows that invite me. I have never contacted a television show to be on. People find me because they're blown away with this philosophy and that somebody's living this way. And, and I, I don't care what people think. I mean, I'm human and sometimes it bothers me if I, I just don't go to message boards after I'm on a show because I'm a sensitive person. However, I know from my the broader perspective that I'm going to just go on and be the voice. If someone has to do this in our culture, I, I am proud to do it. I, I am so happy to be on the forefront of this movement of the evolution of human rights and children's rights. That That's why I decided to do this show. I mean, I am so grateful when I was asked to be on here. I was going to do the show myself. In fact, I was going to do like a blog talk radio thing. I, I had so many people for several years now say, you've you got to do a show yourself because I've been doing interviews for so long and, um, I don't know. I was just nervous about it, I guess, you know, and, and I have four kids, man. I'm a busy woman. I'm almost, I was either nursing or, or pregnant for like 13 years straight. <laughs> I swear to God, it was just like my body, like was for a decade was, at, like, at, okay. <laughs> I was at service to my children, you know, to raising these individuals. And now, man, my youngest is six. And it just all lined up um, when Jules of this network asked me, I was like, yes, I am going to do this and I want to help people. So, Guys, I'm just like you. I wasn't, I did not sought out to like live this radical, crazy life. It just happened really naturally. And I tell you, this works, man. My kids are happy. We're happy. Like parenting is supposed to be happy. It's supposed to feel good. I mean, it's not supposed to be, if, if your life sucks as a parent, you need to really rethink what you're doing because it, where it's not meant to by nature be something difficult or painful or awful. What do you think the authoritarian dynamic is? It's not a happy existence to control somebody else all day long and punish them. It's not. I, and if you're, you're sick, if it is, <laughs> I swear. So, you know, this is, this is something that anybody can do and you have support. You're, you're witnessing history right now and every single show. I am happy. I'm going to do live calls actually in a couple of weeks. I don't know when I'm going to start it. Um, I wanted, to, I didn't know if I could multitask <laughs> quite through taking calls and speaking, but maybe next week or the week after I'll take calls. Um, in the meantime, you know, you can send me an email. You can find out more about who I am by visiting danamartin.com, D-A-Y-N-A-M-A-R-T-I-N.com. I have a YouTube channel. My videos I started were like seven years old, though, so the videos are kind of old on there, but they're kind of what started everything for me. Um, our family's been on the Dr. Phil show. Devin was only six then. That was crazy. Um, we've done wife swap. You can check that show out, but I write articles about, you know, breaking down different aspects. My daughter, Tiffany is a really highly sensitive individual. Um, she's 12 now, but I was told when she was two and three years old that 
she needed to be put in the system and put on medication. And um, because of her sensitivity, she would have been labeled like everything in the book. However, I always listened to my heart and, and followed her lead. And she's the most amazing human being I've ever met. She's her intensity has now shifted to um, so many, so many good aspects about her. <laughs> Devin's probably, I'm laughing and trying not to laugh because he's a big brother to her. So to him, I'm sure she's just still <laughs> pain in the butt sister. However, as her mother, I've just seen an amazing change by just following her lead and supporting her on her own unique path. So I, I write about her often. Um, so tomorrow, check out the Bethany show, but keep an open mind. Know that this is like mainstream filters you're going to be watching through. You can watch what I go through and people scream at me. <laughs> I can't wait to see it. I, I, I hate watching myself on TV. We've done like seven, I don't know, six or seven different television appearances and I, I hate watching them. I don't think I've ever watched one of my videos. I'm just somebody who likes to record them and just never see them again. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but my kids appreciate the work that I've done. And, you know, Devin, we, we've traveled the world speaking about this. That we've, um, We did the first ever unschooling conference in Australia. Um, I, we did the first ever unschooling conference in England. Um, so we were – Devin spoke in Australia a couple of years ago, and you've, you've – kind of turned into quite an advocate yourself, which is something the other kids aren't interested in doing. But what makes you want to speak about this, Dev? I don't know. I mean, I don't like what, I don't really like what the world is right now. and It's not going to change on its own. So I don't know. We've got to just kind of try to, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I know it's kind of a hardcore question to ask somebody. I know who's 14 and, um, I wasn't expecting that one, okay? <laughs> we didn't rehearse any of this. <laughs> Maybe we should for future shows. But, you know, Devin's going to be here. I really wanted Devin's support here because he's like the Skype phenom. Like, I never really use it. And he, like, is always chatting with his friends. So the whole the whole um, social component is such an interesting one with kids that are homeschooled. And people ask me all the time. It's such a played out question, but I will answer it for those of you listening and curious. Um, what about the social aspect of having a child who's homeschooled, unschooled? And I like to say, it's your kids that are in a brick building all day, every day for 12 years away from the real world. And you're asking me <laughs> about my child and their socialization. Well, I mean, my kids aren't age segregated. You know how unnatural it is to put children in the same situation that are the same age? How unnatural it is? I mean, my kids, have they never would think to ask another person, how old are you? Oh, okay, you're seven. I'll hang out with you then. It's just such a conditioned um, age segregation. It's pretty darn damaging. So um, my kids are out in the real world every day experiencing our culture and socializing with people of all different ages, and they base their friendships on common interests, not on the fact that everybody's the same age as them. So, um, you know, whatever questions you have come to mind based on anything I've talked about, this is just the beginning of a huge conversation that I want to have with you every single week. And I'm going to have different guests on. So any suggestions or comments you have, please send me an email to my contact information on my web page. And, um, yeah, if you ever want a parenting coaching call, my schedule's pretty booked up, but I'm always happy to fit you and I will never turn somebody away that needs help. Any final thoughts, Devin? Uh, I don't know. Um, not really. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on with me, buddy. And I don't know um, if, you'll, if I'll even need you next week here. I mean, I'd like you to he hear from moral support and so forth, but um, you could check out I've, my book, Radical Unschooling, A Revolution Has Begun. In my book, Sexy Birth. And thank you guys for tuning in. Try this at home. Thank you. <laughs>